Welcome back to Sip the Talent Films. I'm your host, Coach Evans, and today we have a special show lined up. Uh, we've been getting comments, you know, back and forth, sparingly, like, you should work with this guy, you should work with this guy. And um, All 22 has been one of the guys that people have been recommending we talk football about because they respect what he do on his side, they respect what I do on his side, and they feel like bringing us together will be a great combination. Uh, we met, not physically, but I guess in the virtual space, a while ago, and um, you know everything's been gravy since then. We we share ideas, we talk about football. We have, you know, I think he was a former defensive coach. I'm an offensive coach, so it's nice to bounce stuff off each other and see how one side of the ball feels about the other side. And I always call the defense the dark side because you come up with them nasty, the nasty blitzes that my old line just really couldn't block, especially the one where the, the linebacker would touch the lineman and then run back and drop in coverage. I hated that because we threw up a bunch of interceptions over stuff like that. But again, welcome in uh, Coach DC of All Twenty Two Films to Sip the Salad Films. What up, Coach? Hey, hey, man! Thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, always, you know, fun to appear on people's di- different people's shows, and uh, for to be asked to come on your show was cool because <clears throat> you know I've told you many times, you and EA Edgar Allen was the people whose <clears throat> videos I started watching first, and it probably took me a month before I was like, you know what? I think I'll comment. <laughs> because I wasn't, you know, I, I had started my own channel at one point, but I was like, I'm not trying to jump in somebody else's comments and use it as a, a way to, you know, Brand gather cool. people. Yeah. So um, just for me to be sitting here on your show is just in 2023 is crazy because I remember 2019. I think it was 2019 yeah, well. when I first started watching your videos and EAs and, um, you know, so really cool. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, you know, able to do this more consistently uh, if I get better Internet at my home. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely and, and again when, when mike always says mike from my show life be life so it's hard to kind of match schedules and whatnot and, and go from there so i understand but every chance we get i love to do it and let's kind of jump into what we saw uh christmas night so to speak so obviously the ravens beat the 49ers 33 uh to 19 and a bunch of what i thought was a bunch of subplots to the game and i let you jump in when i tell you obviously the number one where well, the best team in the nfl on the line second subplot the MVP race, Lamar and Brock Purdy. Third subplot that a lot of people probably didn't even realize, Hey, Queen made a statement about them being the best linebacker duo. And you had obviously had the two best linebacker duos playing uh, Sunday night. So all those different things wound up into one game made for me great TV. And, 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 and I'm sure when the numbers come out, NBA is going to be hurting because I, I my NBA team was playing two Miami Heat. I didn't even care. Like NBA, yeah. there's, there's no chance versus the NFL. But um, what are your initial overview of, of what you saw um, Sunday night? Well, Monday night. On the on the numbers, I, I believe I saw 27 million uh, concurrent viewers mm. at one time, which I think is the second most, uh, I believe, ever uh, on Monday. Uh, was it a Monday night football broadcast? Yes. I really. Well, you know. it was. It wasn't on ABC, but it was. Right. It wasn't on ABC. I don't know. I just know. I think I, know why. I can't remember. I th- it was on ABC. I think it. I think it was twenty-seven million. Maybe my numbers off there. Who? Maybe it was higher. But I wasn't surprised because, like you know, t- I didn't watch any of the 49ers defense just because you know, like you and everybody else that tries to create content, there just ain't no, there ain't time mm-hmm. to even for previews, which I love doing previews because I love. I used to love this when I was coaching too. I love like putting something out there to the players or the coaches or in this case, you know, people watch the channel. And, and with the opportunity to be wrong. Mm-hmm. I, I just love it because it, it it puts more responsibility on you to be accurate with what you're watching and right. what you're what you're saying to people, whether that's your players, your coaches, or people listening, you know, to the show or my channel or your channel, because that they in some cases they're relying on you. They're relying on you to be a filter for what you see. And so I didn't get a chance to watch any 49ers um defense at all focused it all on their offense and on the whole Brock Purdy and Lamar Jackson thing. Like I don't get into pl- player comparisons, but I will say this. Lamar has been through the the crucible of defenses showing uh, various looks yep. and uh, it's a problem that you have to solve. And, you know, in some cases Lamar may have struggled initially and then now he knows how to solve it. He's, mm-hmm. he's way past that. Brock Purdy is still in the beginning stages of that. And to me, Monday night looked like, a new set of problems being presented to him. Yes. And and it's not like if somebody told him, Hey, they're going to play this coverage uh, and this is going to be a route combination. It's not like if he had three shots at it, 
he couldn't solve it. He could, and he very well may in the ensuing weeks. But with Mike McDonald and the Ravens defense, man, they're going to give you a different set of problems on every damn snap. Yeah. And um, you know from being an offense coordinator yourself, if if you don't have any idea what coverage is coming up, how do you call the play? It becomes challenging to call the play on the front end, right. number one. It becomes challenging you know, for the O-line and the quarterbacks, whoever's setting the protection. And then post-snap, there's still more problems being presented. Just too much variability and efficiency by the Ravens' defense to deal with. I wish our defense could play against our offense in some uh, virtual environment uh, because I think it'd be fun to watch. Yeah, It's crazy how um, what Mike does on that side of the ball because I can't imagine being a quarterback having to prepare and tell your guy, whatever you see pre-snap, disregard it. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to have to be done post-snap. And keep in mm -hmm. mind, you, you're catching the snap, you're dropping back, you – you know, if you're if you've been getting hit, you, you're watching the old line and you're trying to figure out what they're doing on the defensive end and you're realizing where your receiver is supposed to be. That's a lot to process in three and a half seconds. Yeah. And there's a there's a part of it for me. You you touched on it at the beginning of the show, like you being an offense guy, me being a defense guy. We don't believe defensively in, oh, I'll give them eight. We don't believe in that. Right. I, th I think defensive coordinators may say that at times, but I really don't think they believe that. I think. But. This defense is different. You know, we gave up 58 to Kittles. Mm -hmm. We gave up 39 on the run to McCaffrey. I can't necessarily tell you that I'm okay with this, but to me, there does appear to be an element of our defense that's like, okay, they made that play. They made that play, but they're going to have to keep processing it. Like you mm -hmm. said, post-snap, they're going to have to keep making the right decisions. Not, not just one right decision on each play, but two or three or four in the span of, you know, a second and a half. Right. There's this element of our defense that is kind of like okay with giving up a big play because we know you got to keep doing it. Uh, and Brock Purdy and the 49ers weren't able to get that accomplished. And look, the reality is Kyle Shanahan has to fall on him as well because whatever we did, I do suspect, mm -hmm. still fits in line with when and where Mike McDonald so calls certain coverages. Um, and what I'm talking about is, you know, on certain parts of the field, Mm -hmm. the yeah. high red zone, red zone, whatever. There's tendencies. You got, you, got, you got a package. Exactly. And and I think, I wonder if, did Mike McDonald switch it up? Or did Kyle Shanahan and them uh, not recognize those patterns? I find that part hard to believe. <laughs> but in, in any case, man, the Ravens, what they dialed up in each situation was ridiculous. And that was before Trent Williams went out. We were already causing them a hell of a lot of problems. It was three interceptions on the first four possessions. That's not fluky. That's not an accident. That's right. That is what we're doing is presenting you with too many problems uh, to try to juggle all at the same time. Let, let's talk about one of those interceptions, uh, mainly the one Marlo got. And we talk about the different problems that, that Mike mm. presents. But if you think about that play, you had, a, you had two cat blitzes coming from yep. both sides. They were in a condensed formation. And the good, I mean, the thing about it is Debo read it. Debo and Brock Purdy read it. So yep. Debo went when when Brandon Stevens came off that corner, Debo took one step, showed his numbers. Yep. Brock Purdy saw it, tried to get it over there to him. Brandon Stevens makes an incredible acrobatic play to tap it up. And Marlowe just happened to be blitzing from the other side where the ball had fallen into his arms. Like I've never seen double cats. Never. I think I, th I remember us running it in 2020 against the Titans at home um, when they came to us, of course, they, you know, they had beaten us in the playoffs the year before. I'm talking about the regular season game, 2020. Mm -hmm. We ran it from a 4-3 look, which is when I have seen that, is I've seen it from a 4-3 platform so that those, you know, the two inside linebackers, Sam and Will, can can scrape over the top mm -hmm. if they need to. You know, you pinch the DNs, you know, inside. Forgive me, those of you that are listening, if you don't understand the terminology, I know Coach does, but you you got the corner blitzes coming off both sides. You're basically creating a, a six-man rush, mm -hmm. but you still got two safeties back there. Uh, the Lions have done it twice this year that I've seen. I've, it ends up looking like two deep, three under, which is not a real coverage. But uh, I, I do think I saw it one time from the Ravens earlier this year, but it might have been week five, maybe week six. But that's the only other time I can remember it. Uh, credit to Mike McDonald for pulling that out. And on one level, like Brock Purdy and Debo Samuel being able to read it in live time because that's a run play. It's, mm -hmm. it's a run play. It's all run blocking, you know, yep. to the bunch. So I think it was 21 personnel, bunch of right. And um and Brock Purdy seeing it, and then they look back at Christian McCaffrey like I'm, I'm supposed to hand this off. Oh, I can do this. No, you yeah. can't. Brandon Stevens is just too athletic. Ridiculous play, 
that illustrates how tough it is to get something accomplished, execute something against when us. He, when he pulls the ball, you see Christian kind of shrivel up to kind of make sure he don't bump. Mm -hmm. because it, because it, like you said, it is a straight run. But that's that's the game of football. We we made a play. They made an uh, instantaneous uh, adjustment. We just happened to be a, you know make an athletic play on the defensive side. And it's that's, yeah. that's how nuanced football is. L little simple stuff like that. Then you got your your older guys continuing with this defensive tread, like the what Benoit and what um, Clowney's giving us, like defensively. Who who would have thought that? Like Benoit, no, he, mean, he always says it's off the couch university. He was chilling the first three or four weeks. Clowney <laughs> was considered, I ain't gonna say washed up, but there are a bunch of people in in Ravens Twitter and Ravens YouTube that say he was washed when we picked him up. Right. He had one better 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 seasons of his career, and he seems to love it here. I've love never it. seen people talk about a linebacker and i'm not saying roquan is right but i just constantly see so many good things about what kind of leadership roquan is right. providing this team and you, yeah. you get a guy that you get somebody in the middle that they can kind of gravitate to that, that means a lot that means a lot to them guys with him with that late in his career for clowning he probably just want to win the money is yep. probably secondary but I, you know you want to make as much money as you can but you want he want to win a ring mm-hmm you see, you think about maybe maybe some I don't know the percentage obviously of listeners to anybody's channel, mine or yours that that play football versus didn't or or coach football. So I have no idea what it is, but whatever the percentage is that didn't, uh, for you, do it this way. Have you ever been in a classroom with a with a great teacher, or have you ever been in a work environment with a great boss, mm -hmm. or or two of them? Roquan Smith in those two analogies is the great teacher. Or he right. is. I mean, Mike McDonald's a teacher too. But I'm talking. You're talking about, you know, leadership, mm -hmm. keeping keeping people focused on their job and doing the the little things in order to get their job accomplished, but doing so in a positive way, not being uh, overbearing. Whatever you want to say mm -hmm. about Roquan Smith and Clowney mentioned it. Um, I think. Excuse me, Kyle Van Noy mentioned it on Twitter a couple of days ago, and, and other people have mentioned it as well. Roquan seems like that guy. <laughs> he just does. Uh, that's that's able to push people in a positive direction and then live up to that standard himself, which is a, a rare trait in life. Uh, it doesn't seem to be rare with this Ravens team, though, on both sides of the ball, offense and defense. we got guys doing that. I'm amazed at Clowney and Van Noy. They've, to me at this point, um, I got I really don't have any trouble saying that. Like if, if it's a game, if it's a play to decide a game, I don't want I want them to on the field. Let's mm -hmm. do it that way. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100 percent. They, they effort, they have savviness, and their ability to recognize, hey, it's go time. Like, like I, may, I may be playing at 85, 90%. Right. But I, I recognize, hey, we need this third down. I'm going going all out. If I got to come out afterwards, I got to come out. I think it. I think there's a statement about the Ravens and Roquan Smith and the way that the Ravens do things as a franchise. It's fine if people want to make that statement. Hey, people can come here and succeed higher than the rate at which they have been succeeding for other teams. Fine. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm okay with that. But I also think there's something to be said about the the environment that's created by the players, you know, the, by the players on that defensive side. They've they've got to be in tune with what Mike McDonald and the other coaches are doing. And, man, I, I would be okay if they re-signed Clowney and Van Noy right now. <laughs> I just would for next year. I would. I know that's crazy because Van Noy's 33. There's so much discourse and dialogue about when are players too old. OBJ. OB, they talked about that with OBJ when he signed with the Ravens. He's too old. Um, I think I think I just believe in people, and I believe in you know Van Noy and Clowney. I think are great examples of you can um, older players, older people got at least one more fight in them if they yeah. really if they really really want it. Yeah, they got to believe in the system, believe in the people, and they'll they'll go out there and lay it down for you. Especially with um, you know a lot the way people gravitate gravitate toward Lamar too. But um, as yeah. far as as far as Monday. Defensively, and I, and I know you you put a couple of videos out already. Sum up what the Ravens did to kind of slow down Purdy because McCaffrey still had a hundred. Um, I think he had some receiving yards. Yeah, Kittle, Kittle had a great start and had over a hundred, and now you had over a hundred. So what what did the Ravens do to kind of stifle Purdy from maximizing the weapons that he had? Whatever, whatever we do coverage wise to to practice our coverages and then because, you know, yourself from being an offensive 
coordinator. There's only so many coverages that a high school team can play and be effective at, mm-hmm. at those coverages. Let's call it three. You know, there's there's some that can do four or five. There's some that can only do two, whatever. Mm-hmm. G- go up one level, college level. Their effectiveness level, they, there's probably eight that they can play, maybe six that they can play at a really high level mm-hmm. and cover everything up from those six coverages. At the NFL level, some would say it was probably 12. I disagree. At the NFL level, I have not seen very many teams that can be great at that many coverages. I, I think it's the same number as college, six mm-hmm. or maybe eight. And this Ravens team appears to be the kind of team that can do eight. Now, that's probably too many, too high a number in and of itself. But I use that number to illustrate that when you're Brock Purdy walking up to the line and it's a second and four and it's a play action pass, you don't know whether it's a, you call it a double cat. We call it a double bullet blitz with the corners. You don't know whether it's a nickel blitz and we're dropping out the two D tackles into our two deep four under. You don't know if we're playing Tampa two, uh, cover three. Additionally, for our coverages, this is second year in a row. I feel like our coverage has gotten tighter and better yep. later in the year. They, they um, look more like what I think zone should look like. Even yeah. though it's zone, once that man is in your zone, it is man. Yeah. Until, until he gets out of your zone and you pass him off to somebody else. If we, a lot of people say zone and man coverage. I think everything is man, especially even when you when you call temper three, temper two, cover three, cover four, whatever. And now cover four got a bunch of different rules to it. But when that guy comes in your, your zone, it's man. Until he gets out of your zone and you communicate that, hey, you know, you pass him on that way. Don't just let him go. But exactly. that, that's the way I see it. Yep, he's in your zone. He's your man. There's a there's a portion of that. You just have a leverage side. We all we also used to say to our kids, uh, first day of practice. In fact, we would say all zone becomes man at some point, and all man becomes zone at some point. And that that's a that, that second part is a no, totally different conversation. But as far as what they did, multiple multiple looks, mm-hmm. number one, and then they brought the physicality. Yes. Um, I, you know, Christian McCaffrey had an impact. He's a great player, man. There's you know he's going to have an impact, but. The hit that Travis Jones and Broderick Washington laid on him. Mm. I thought there was one. It might have been Roquan or Queen. I still haven't seen it. It was down the bottom side of the broadcast screen. The 49ers are going left to right. I thought there was one down there that was physical. Additionally, there was a uh, a pass route. He's going out into a route. I actually covered it on my channel in a video I put out last night where Queen just kind of chips him a little bit. <clears throat> it's a third and – I think it's a third and four. Mm-hmm. Incomplete to Willie Sneed over the middle against Darby. The one that hit Darby in the face mask. Right. Near, mm-hmm. Yeah. Could have been the fifth interception at that point, I think. Um, Queen just makes slight contact with him. And on the on the film, even the all 22, you may say, well, that's nothing. Man, try running full speed out in your route, Christian McCaffrey. And then a 235, 240-pound linebacker who runs a 4-6 or whatever Queen runs, you know, gets enough of your shoulder, your, your forearm, whatever, to impede your progress. That's a – that's more than just a hand check in basketball. I like right. to use basketball analogies. That's not a hand check. No. That's a that's a that's a pick that's being set where somebody puts the shoulder in your chin. That's on you the football beat. field. That's right. You don't. That's right. Exactly. And I, I love the physicality that they brought, which is a simplistic answer to your question. When they hit McCaffrey, mm-hmm. when they got to Brock Purdy, uh, Matabike additionally split the double team twice. Uh, where I thought if he don't split that double team, it looks like a six or eight yard gain. So on some level, our scheme had an impact. Our versatility had an impact. There's a few times where I just think dudes made plays. Right. <laughs> I, I tell people that all the time. Like Defense, you can have a great defense, but you the defensive players don't have to be great every play. As long as they do their job, it only takes one guy yeah. every play or two to make a defense look good. It could be your, 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 your defensive end getting a sack one play. It could be your, your Mike linebacker being the ball because they can have people out of out of position. Yeah. If one guy makes a play, the whole defense looks good. But on offense, all eleven got to be doing what they supposed mm-hmm. to be, or you going it's gonna be like a, like a cluster out there. Um, I think I think there was sorry sorry to interrupt you, but I had a thought too after he had thrown the third interception, uh, mm-hmm. and this is this is me being an old man and a coach. You know, there's a there's a protective element for your players. And for a moment there, I was I watched Kyle Shanahan and Brock Purdy's interaction after the third interception. Mm-hmm. Broadcast showed it for a minute. And um for a moment there, I was thinking to myself, if I'm Kyle Shanahan right now, I'm th- I'm thinking, what if he throws five? What if he <laughs> throws six? Because mm-hmm. you're you're talking about a player that you presumably want to retain for a, now, me and you, we're we're thinking of our players in high school, protective right. of them. Um, I'm extrapolating that a little bit towards Brock Purdy. 
I do wonder if some of the early issues influenced the play calls in in similar situations situations later on. I'm not saying conservative or whatever that stupid uh, post somebody made on Twitter, like a 49ers whatever, maybe content creator fan, like, oh, he he was conservative to save place for the Super Bowl. Man, both come on, man, that's right. insane. Uh, but I do think that the the result of three of the first four drives mm-hmm. may have impacted the play calls at times. Did it become more vanilla, more conservative? Uh, did did he say, I'm not going to call this pass concept because it's been intercepted once and nearly intercepted a second time. I do think that is a real dynamic that happens uh, with with any coach that's responsible and, and feels something towards you know their players, especially by somebody who has as much success as Purdy did so far this year before Monday night. I think part that's part of it. But if you think about the interception versus the touchdown Sam Darnold threw, pretty much the same concept. The only difference is when Darnold was in, they had a guy to pull the, the safety that, that was playing the position. Yeah. That Kyle did. When they ran it the first time, they had two short routes. And Kyle just looked at them short routes. And when they, when they both broke their different directions, his, yep. his eyes went to the quarterback. And guess what? Yep. The ball was coming. So he never had to move. And then when yep. they threw the touchdown later, when uh, Darnold was in, they actually had a guy that the safety had to defend. That's why the middle of the field stayed open. Also, too, I, I, I had seen that route <clears throat> leading up to the game, but I had seen it out of 11 personnel. Mm-hmm. So the little China in that um, Huschek was running, Mm-hmm. Was a, was a receiver from a compressed alignment that ran that, and that's where Purdy went with the football. I, I want to say maybe week seven or eight. It was during their three game losing streak. I forget which game: Vikings, Bengals, or Browns. Um, and I hate to say this; this is going to sound very um, disrespectful, but <laughs> I did not think that their t- I didn't think their eleven personnel was a great matchup for them against us. I just did not leading into the game. And then once I saw two or three possessions. I did not think that 21 personnel with Huschek on the field was a matchup in their favor either. Compare it to the Rams. Um, I think our nickel against the Rams 11 personnel offense is a bad matchup for us right. because right. of the style, the style of play that the Rams are committed to. Under center, compress formations, run the football, and see if you can stop that first. That's and not what the – f- They get them receivers in there. Like, their receivers do not mind mixing it up with linebackers. Exactly. And this is not, you know, this is not the same thing from an 11 personnel standpoint with the 49ers. For, uh, I like combat sports. I don't know if you do, but, you know, boxing, mixed martial arts. I, f- I feel like the Rams against us is a matchup that is a good, is a favorable matchup for the Rams from the standpoint of their 11 personnel against our nickel defense. I don't think the 49ers have a similar advantage in either of their personnel groups. And I thought 21 personnel was. Uh, to your point about that play, those two little short routes, Hughes check is not really an option there. Right. To that to that route, you know, for Purdy to say, oh, I'm going to bring it back to him underneath this little split field call- coverage, um, you know, and he's going to get four or five, six yards. That to me doesn't look like something that's available to them with Hughes check on the field, uh, you know. But they, um, they, use, they use him in, in a way that – they, I think they would like to for us to use Ricard, but he's just yeah. a little bit more athletic. And I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about their personnel packages that you just mentioned. Like, yeah, 21 doesn't seem like it favors them, even though because we pretty much gonna be in the, almost gonna be in the same personnel, almost, especially when Kyle's out there. And then you go in there 11, like I'm thinking about who their slot receiver is. Whoever their slot receiver is really don't have an advantage versus what we have. Um, or because I, I know Jennings was, wasn't there. And correct. Jennings would Jennings would have moved Debo. Damn, they're primarily to the slot. He's and a correct. He's a good they blocker. Have that then. But mm-hmm. without, without Jennings and Debo had to be an outside guy, then you could outside guy and you really you threw Sneed in there as your slot. It, that mm-hmm. favors us. And then they cut Sneed yes. already. They cut him just today. Yeah, I know. I did. I just didn't think that going into the game. I said this to the guys in my Discord. I was like, I just don't think their eleven personnel is capable of doing to us in the run game. Mm-hmm. what the Rams 11 personnel was capable of doing to me, their run, the 49ers run offense. Um, I think it was skeptic goat one time. He either said it or said it to me in a message or whatever. He said, you're revealing your intentions um, before the ball was snapped. Mm-hmm. And I think the 49ers run game, it's a great run game. Like that's a badass offense. I love what they do. However, it's predicated on 21 personnel or 12 personnel. 
I don't know, in my opinion, I may be wrong. I don't know what the 11 personnel run stats look like for them. Uh, they might look better than I'm making it sound. That's fine with me. But what I saw prior to the game is what I saw Monday night. Their 11 personnel did not threaten us in the run game nearly the same way that the Rams did. And um, then the 21 personnel was somewhat limited in the pass game, even though they did generate some big plays. They had seven plays of 20 yards or more. So, you know, they were able to get some things done. The problem is the risk factor for them with a misread by the quarterback or offensive line not blocking something well, the risk factor is higher because we can turn you over. We got a lot of playmakers on defense. Yeah, exactly. And th- th- their, their thing is they want to invite you to, to play that run so they can throw in those pocket windows behind linebackers. And when the, when the game got kind of I can say out of hand, but extend, that extended lead that took away your play action. Yeah. Now you're in straight drop back mode. And I, and I told the guy, the Crocker, Eric Crocker, I was on his uh, channel of 49 and stuff. We couldn't do anything but Trent, but we kicked the mother for ass. Yeah. I thought they were so – coming into the game, I was like, okay, there's a little bit of a tendency here to run to their left. Mm-hmm. Man, it was like it was like late second quarter after that touchdown drive they had. I said to guys in my Discord, I said, all their runs are to their left. Exactly. And if, <laughs> and if it wasn't to their left, the only run that I saw them to their right that they were comfortable calling was that 12 personnel toss pitch. Mm-hmm. Where, the, where the second tight end in motion, you know, kicks out your edge defender and Clowney destroyed that twice. Yep. Jumping inside of it so that that edge was, you know, basically wrong armed kind of. He didn't he didn't wrong arm the second tight end, but mm-hmm. you there was no gap there. He wasn't expanded at all. That toss play that everybody runs now. We tried it. We first started trying it last year against the Dolphins. It didn't work uh, right. for us. Uh, I don't think it's worked real great this year either. But um once we took away the only run they had to their right, our left, that was threatening us, I was like, man, they've got run to the left behind Williams, uh, maybe some play action off of that. But any drop back pass, yeah, Purdy's got to process all this stuff, man. If the risk factor was higher against us on Monday than it was in any of their preceding games. Agreed. Agreed 100%. And they they, they stood, t- stood tall, got turnovers. Um and, and and a lot of people say if it wasn't for turnovers, we we probably wouldn't have beat them. Uh you know, they gave us an opportunity to figure some stuff on offensively. Yeah. And like I said, with, with them not being able to move the ball as 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 easily as they were offensively, I still think we, you know, it may not have been by 14 points, but I still think we went we win that game. Yeah, well, think- when we had to, well, let's see, Lamar takes us down the field late second quarter and we get a field goal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was a long drive. I think that started from our negative 25. So seven, mm-hmm. 70, 75 yard drive. One of them started on the five. I don't know if it yes. was that or not. Third quarter. I think that was, was third, third quarter. quarter. Okay. Yeah. That one also resulted in a field goal. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about two drives of 75 yards and I think 89 yards that resulted in field goals. Number one. You know, number two, we did you now we got a short field. We got a nine yard touchdown, you know, after a turnover. We got a field goal after a turnover as well. So the yard disparity. Makes sense to me because we got short field twice. I mean, mm-hmm. what we're gonna do? We get a turnover on their nine yard line. Say, hey, let's back this up to the fifty, so we get we get another forty one yards on our offensive yard total. No, you know, I think from an offensive standpoint, we had things that we were executing. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I do not think that their cornerbacks uh, match up really well with what we can throw out there on the field in eleven personnel. You no, know, I just I just don't. Um, and those guys are pretty good players. Don't get me wrong. We missed a wheel. To Justice Hill twice. He's open mm-hmm. both times. The second time, he's wide open. Uh, we missed uh, – I don't think it was Bateman. We went somewhere else with the football. So when I say I missed, I hate this. I hate even have to put this caveat out there. People are like, oh, you saying Lamar should have thrown – no, he's looking – the read is on the other side. Uh-huh. You know, so – but we we had available uh, an available throw. I believe it was on a seam route to our left. I can't remember who exactly it was. But so we had guys open against them that – would have been generated bigger plays mm-hmm. with the read was just on the opposite side. I feel, I feel like we are the type of team that matches up well with the 49ers. Uh, were we to play the Rams again and they run the same stuff they run on offense? I think they're going to give us similar problems. I just, it's matchup based, I think. And, and we're a good matchup for the 49ers right now. I think that if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> the play that Lamar t- threw across his body to um, likely, when he scrambled a little bit and it was kind of like mm. he kind of turned his body the, on the opposite side of that play. And yes. uh, that, like I said, the read wasn't over there. Aguilar streaking down the middle of the field. Yes, that's and right. That, that may be the play you're talking about. He's yep. streaking down the middle of the field. Like, why? And I, honestly, 
like I said, I because I covered it earlier today. I don't think he could have got to it because the initial read was from the other side and pressure started to come. But had he been able to sit in the pocket, that might have been probably exactly. an 80, 80 some yard uh, touchdown because Aguilar, the safety split, and Aguilar running that seam right down the middle. Right. We also the we had a twenty yard completion to Bateman that didn't count. We had an eight yard completion mm-hmm. to Aguilar that didn't count. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some times where in Lamar's mind. You know, he's got availability to scramble out of there. I thought our O-line did a pretty daggone good job most of the I night. There was there was maybe two possessions where I felt like the pressure started to to build from their, you know, their pass rush. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, I thought, man, these guys did a nice job. And uh Lamar, they they consistently had DNs try to win to the top side, not necessarily speed rush, but you know, outside rush. Let's do it that mm-hmm. way. And our tackles, Moses and Stanley, give them credit. They continued to ride them dudes out of there such that Lamar was able to move up. Well, if you're Lamar and you move up and there's a six-yard gap over here right in front of your face, um, take it. You've been doing that since you're 10, 12 years old. So I did feel like there was two opportunities where, you know, we have guys potentially if Lamar has three-tenths of a second more, he could get the ball down there. But there's there's a wide open lane to scramble, and those don't count as passing yards. But they certainly do count against the defense, man. I thought I thought their defense got worn down, worn down late second quarter, mm-hmm. and was not having any fun on that late second quarter drive to me at all. Yeah, they. This is this is our possessions from the the end of the first quarter all the way to the beginning of the fourth quarter. Field goal, touchdown. Field goal, field goal, touchdown, touchdown, field goal. That's seven from, straight that's scores. Last, that's from the last possession in the first quarter to the last possession in the third quarter. Seven straight possessions with points on the board. Hmm. That, that's mm. amazing. <laughs> uh, offensively, mm. as a, as a whole, and we, we kind of been hitting on it a little bit. Um, I'm really liking the fact that the offense has continued to get better, and not saying that Mark's like expendable or nothing like that. But I, we didn't just go down the tank when Mark got injured. Like everybody else has pulled their pants up and started to carry a little bit more weight. Even Keaton was carrying away before what happened to him. Um, as mm-hmm. far as I feel like we've gotten better offensively, but we've gotten simpler too. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, that sounds like from a coaching standpoint, for both for you to say that and for me to hear it or vice versa, that's like, hold on a second. How does that happen? Well, on the, I, I've experienced that. I know you have too. You get better at something week seven, eight, nine than you certainly were in week one or two. But you're talking about being better in week 16 than we were in week eight, nine, or 10. Exactly. You know, which is, which is, it seems like it'd be really tough to do. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, look, I've been critical of Todd Munkin at times this year. I feel like we've been a little uh, up and down. You know, we'll have a real good week and then a, a really weird week. Week yep. two, week two Cincinnati, our offense goes in there, doesn't turn the football over. We do whatever we want in the pass game and the run game. To, at that at that point, I'm like, man, this is still a good Bengals defense. It's still coached by Lou Anarumo, mm-hmm. you know, a guy who I respect. And then week three at home against the Colts, um, I think we really uh, messed the bed up, you know, offensively. Let's put it that way. All right. Um, but Todd Munkin coached with Kirby Smart. He's been in the rooms with Kirby Smart, the expectation level. Listen to Kirby Smart talk. Mm-hmm. It's not Nick Saban, but it might as well be, you know, in, in some ways. And Todd Munkin not, didn't just survive that. He, he thrived. In, in that situation. It doesn't surprise me that he comes here and brings a system that gets better over the course of the year. I do think we're very multiple. Mm-hmm. I think we're very multiple and we can present, you know, a run look, a pass look. And then I think we do a great job of designing things over the course of the season. A uh, uh, Munkin's bunch, a, you know, bunch with the back on the same side mm-hmm. is I, I feel like it's bait coach. I feel like it's, I feel like it's, oh, we're going to run pin pull pitch out of this mm-hmm. week one, week two, week three, and then each week kind of revealing another play out of that. And then, of course, this week, you know, when we got the turnover to Patrick Queen interception, unbalanced bunch A. Yep. And we're going to fake the pitch and throw it up the seam as A flowers. You can see the 49ers players identifying it pretty snap. Yeah. Uh, and um, oh, and, I just, I'll, I'll, and even going over there. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I just I feel like we're multiple, and there's some real benefits to that. Drawbacks, maybe you, you reduced effic- efficiency, excuse me, at times because you're trying to do so many things. But look at what our defense is doing. They're being very multiple, and they're efficient at all of those things. 
I think the offense is doing the same thing. We just got such high expectations for our talent level and having Lamar Jackson as the quarterback. When we're not scoring 32 points a game, we think there's something wrong. Right. Uh, I'm I'm amazed at what we've been able to do this year. I'm not surprised, really. Mm -hmm. You know yourself, uh, players, athletes, especially the high-achieving ones, they respond to tough coaching. We were talking about it with teachers, you know, before the show. Uh, I don't think athletes respond to soft coaches. I just don't. They don't. Um, I don't mean, you know, you can be a calm, cool, collected coach. The One of the best defensive coordinators I know, he just won his seventh state title uh, two weeks ago. And he, he doesn't curse. He's a, a devout Christian, very calm and cool and collected. But his expectation level is high and he's got a great system. Mm -hmm. And the players respond to it. Um, so you don't have to be fiery and cursing all the time, but apparently that's how Todd Munkin is. Yeah. I, and I, I've been there with him. I don't know if you I know. love it. I, um, yeah, you told me I was still coaching high school. Yeah. I, the, the hour I got to spend with him, <laughs> I learned a lot and learned a lot about his, and this was no 10 plus years ago because he was still working at LSU then. I remember you told me, you told me in a message, you, you were, you know, I didn't know a, a ton about him other than he coached at Georgia. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I reached out to you and said something and you were like, yeah, I've been in a room with him. And you know, some of the things that you had said was like, I was like, okay, if a, if a coach that you respect co-signs another coach, then that's almost the same as you being there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, some of those, some of those glazier clinics, you get in a room, you know, you get in a room with somebody and you can tell. You can tell within about two minutes, like, man, if it wasn't 60 coaches sitting here, I'd be walk, I'd walk out of this one. And I go over exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, I was taught different. My, my head coach said, Hey man, you sit in the front and make eye contact just like a student. And then, uh, you know, try to initiate a conversation with a dude. So I trapped myself a couple of times, but it doesn't sound like Todd Munkin is that kind of guy. Uh, sounds like he's the kind of guy that would be entertaining, drop a couple F bombs yeah, and give you, give you some stories about great players, um, and how they responded to his coaching. I think you can hear it in the way that our offensive players, including Lamar, have talked about him. You know, mm -hmm. he, I, think, I think the first quote was something like, he brings a different energy. Yeah, especially in training camp. You That's need when that. You first start hearing about it. You need that. Training camp and OTA, you, you start hearing about how different he was and how even John would say it in a couple um couple press conferences. But I, I like where he's going so far. I like, like the the – the building of plays, the layering of plays yeah. that, that, that he's doing. And again, as far as the simplicity part that I talked about, when, when, right before Keaton went away, simple inside zone. They do choose good grass. Play. Ain't no grass bro. <laughs> simple, <laughs> yeah, it was, um, down there it does right now, not where I am right now. <laughs> simple inside zone. That's all Keaton was needed. Inside yeah. zone, outside zone. Huge and loss. We're we going to the, the, the reality is, you know, we're, at some point we're going to miss that. Because, mm -hmm. because those other guys are, are, you know, Gus is a proven back. You know, right. Gus is proven. Justice Hill has proven himself as well, but not nearly to the extent that Gus has. You know, um, but that that ability to bust a simple play, yeah, that I heard. Now they said during the broadcast it was ACL. I didn't hear that until Monday. For, for who? For Keaton Mitchell, I didn't think it was ACL. I, I think it was AC. I think that's what I heard initially. AC. Oh man, mm. so I thought three sixty five for one at least. Mm. Yeah, man, that's you know, not just for him, but because he was a UDFA and man, like you know, anybody that's a UDFA. I had a friend of mine I went to school with. Um, he's a little younger than me. He was probably one of the best inside linebackers our school ever had, and he was a UDFA. I think he did. I think he was in like two camps, maybe three, with uh, Redskins at the time, and um. I mean, just a beast of a player. And uh, I just remember thinking to myself, like, he ain't good enough. <laughs> you know, he ain't good enough to hang around. So all those UDFA guys, I just I feel for them trying to develop uh, a spot in the league or, or maintain a niche in the league. And, and Mitchell, man, being able to bust simple plays brought a whole new element to us that was just – reminded me of <clears> – <throat> I know you're about as old as me uh, – reminded me of Richard Dumas. You ever remember him? Played with the Phoenix Suns. He was a six seven, six eight guy when they played in the finals with the Bulls. You remember him or no? Hold on, I remember that finals. I'm trying to remember if I remember Dumas because I, I, I'm a basketball <clears throat> junkie too. <laughs> well, so so go you after the show. Tom Chambers team. Uh, uh, well, it's old Tom Chambers. This is Charles Barkley. This is mm -hmm. Charles Barkley. So go look it up after this. And he was a six, seven, six, eight athlete. I don't think he had much shooting skills, but <clears throat> first of all, long arms range ability to elevate on people. I think he dunked on Rodman in them finals. I may be wrong. So, you know, he, he was the type of guy that would shoot like 58% for the year. 
because he could just do things other people couldn't. He could get up to heights other people couldn't. Keaton Mitchell, while being a small guy, that's where our comparison breaks down, is the kind of guy who can bust a simple inside zone, outside zone concept you know, from 70 yards away. And now we don't have to execute four, five, six other concepts. We just – we already scored, you know. Uh, people don't realize it's tough. You, you constantly start your drives at 20 to 25 yard line. It's tough to put drives together. And to have a guy that, for me – Every time he touched the ball, I sat up. Like I might yes. be in my seat, laid back, but every time he touched the ball, I'm sitting up because I know any missed tackle, any overplay, he can hit his head on the goalpost. Yeah, and he go definitely gonna miss that a, a that's lot. That's what justice is the closest thing to it, but he ain't yeah. got to choose like Keaton. And that's what I meant with the with the comparison of the super athletic dunker in the NBA was you know a guy who can a guy who can just do something that no one else can do. There's another reason why we love Keaton Mitchell too because we Ravens content creators we know if we put a Keaton Mitchell video out after he scored two touchdowns, people are gonna oh, yeah. watch it. Oh yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> oh, definitely. It's, 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 it's business to it too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It was more more than one reason to a root for him and then you know obviously b be so disappointed for when he went down because the ceiling of what we're capable of offensively changed. It did change that day um, drastically. And then I don't know what percentage to apply to it. I would say at least three to 5% uh, ceiling for us changed. Uh, think about Madden ratings, you know, what's your offense, 88, a 91, whatever it is, plus three or five to it with Keaton Mitchell. I right. think that's what we lost. We went down definitely to maybe a, a, a 85 with, because it's, you didn't see a lot of inside zone like you saw the week before because they was hitting inside zone. It was like a base play, and Keaton was obviously the number one back. But then with, with that happened to him, you got to, you know, switch it up. You got you to like, kind of go back to a little bit more gap stuff. You got to be sound in your in your runs because, you know, Gus got to have it blocked right. Yep. I like getting – I like us <clears throat> letting our offensive line get up on top of guys with the zone concept. Two guys getting hands on one on one defensive tackle or defensive line. I like that. You know, that's where the 49ers, that toss play we talked about earlier, is is brutal and just beautiful because, you know, one tight end engages that edge defender, that nine technique, and then the second tight end comes, you know, and it's the it's the delayed or the layered blocking of it too, excuse me. It's not an initial combo on the snap. It's one guy hitting him and a second guy hitting him, you know, 0.7 seconds later. The base is not there for the edge defender because he's dealing with the first block. I love our O-line being allowed to combo people. Because I think we got some guys that are really, really good at it. You know, obviously, um, Linderbaum is real good at it. I thought Zeitler had a good game uh, Monday, especially two situations in pass pro. He peeled off mm -hmm. and and knocked Bosa down once. A second time, I think it was um, is it Cleveland Farrell? Farrell, however yeah, you say his yeah, name, yeah. the one from Clemson, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there. Um, I thought Zeitler played well, and I mean Simpson had the one bad uh, bad penalty that brought that that. 20 yard completion back to Bateman, but I thought I thought Simpson played quite well as well. Right. I normally have jokes for Simpson. The past two and a half weeks I've been kind of laying off because he's gotten a lot better at, you know, stay, basically just staying off the ground. You yep. you'd go back and watch, you know, different run run games or even pass games, and he'd always be on the ground. Like whether yeah. it's get holding or tripping or just getting mauled. But lately he's been, you know, up to par. And again, for you know, them four guys, them six guys that we faced, because I had forgot they had Randy Gregory. Them guys, yeah. that's that's legit, possibly the best D line in, in in football, and um, they held their own. We had two sacks, but for the most part, we pretty much yeah. I ain't gonna say shut them out, but did what they needed to do to do what he needed to do. There's something to be said about them even front teams, and what I mean is, you know, we're obviously an odd front team from a base standpoint. Mm -hmm. The Jets, the 49ers, those teams that you know we're talking about DNs, not not outside linebackers. Right. You know, the the Jets in their little three and a half or four point stance, whatever you want to call it. And the the 49ers, Bosa, Young, and them other guys, they're they're three point stance guys. They not they're not three, four ounce OLBs are gonna drop, you know, out like our guys are. Right. So there's maybe a little bit less multiplicity in what they're asked to do, but some of them even front teams that uh get those guys in three point stances ninety five percent of the time, it's a real pain to deal with those teams. Them dudes are well trained mm -hmm. in their technique out there on the edge. And it's a different animal, man, for those guys to be in that low stance versus a stand up. Uh, I think there, I think there's some drawbacks, yeah. really, for us in, in what we do. But the, what we gain is the multiplicity, the versatility of them guys dropping, uh, stunting inside. Uh, that that cover three drop that we did with um, Van Noy and Queen switching mm -hmm. was amazing. 
uh, I forget, I think it was third quarter, cover three, it was third down. We, we switch it up, and Purdy looks at it. You can just see from the end zone angle. You can see he's like, one, two, uh, where can I go with this ball? <laughs> There's nowhere. That's, that's the multi- multiplicity of it. And, and um, before we close out, you brought up a word earlier that that I use, and we hadn't even talked about it. because I, So I know you kind of seen what I said. You said the word multiple. Somebody asked me, um, like with us not really having an offensive identity, how hmm. does that, that help or hinder the you know the offensive game plan? And I told them that it's really twofold because you if, without having a l- legit play or concept that if it's third and four, or third and six, right. I know if I run this pass or this run, I'm getting uh, three or six, whatever yards may be. It they don't for defensively, you, you now don't have tendencies, so they can't yes. in a certain situation arise. They can't say, oh, they're gonna go to this. But then offensively, you just you don't have a a bread and butter stick. So it's 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 good to be multiple, and that's the word I eventually use. But it's hard as heck to be multiple because it's 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 it takes a lot of teaching. You got to have patience, and you got to have guys that can learn and I translate agree. what they learn from the film to the field because you don't have a lot of practice time when you add new stuff. I agree, man. It's you know, a simple answer. <laughs> is it a good thing or a bad thing to be multiple offensively? I'll, I'll tell you an answer. I was told uh, probably twelve years ago. That depends on whether we win our last game of the season or not. Because <laughs> if we do, then it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. But if we don't, then that's going to be one of the criticisms. Um, I do. I do think that in the case of Todd Munkin, he had a lot of benefits or privilege in this this situation. He got to come in and and Lamar Jackson was there. Number one, number two, Lamar Jackson was ready for something new. So he didn't know exactly what Todd Munkin was going to show up with, but he had an idea. I'm sure him and OBJ had communicated uh, at the the high school level, the level we've been at. It it happens. Your, your juniors, usually in the spring, you know, your eighth graders come over and lift or whatever, or maybe you meet them before then. Your juniors tell the eighth graders, hey, man, don't mess with this dude. He's serious. Talking about the coaches. Or, mm-hmm. hey, listen to coach whatever because he helps us win. The, the co-signing happens from your juniors or sophomores to your eighth graders. So you really don't have to threaten the eighth grade kid because they've already got the they already got the message. Yep. From, from the standpoint of Lamar and Munkin, I think OBJ was probably that guy saying, hey, man, he, he'll take us home. He knows what to do. You know, he, it's going to be totally different for you, number one. So Munkin had that privilege of Lamar being ready for a new offense, being capable to do all the things he wanted to do. But then also, too, he had a great defense to – what's the word? You said it. You, ha- you have to be patient when you're trying to be multiple. We had some of the weeks that were frustrating. Well, we have a great defense. We're still able to be in the game. We lose to the Colts. We lose to the Steelers. You know. Learn. And is we're learning, but the defense kept us in the game when the offense had them struggles. We we very easily could have won both of those games with the offense, you know, being quite inconsistent or horrible in some cases. All so right. he had the benefit of a great defense being around, uh, so that we could, you know, continue to do those things, stay on that path of of being multiple. I think, I, I think you have to give credit to Harbaugh too, mm-hmm. because he on some level is willing to let that happen. Um, regardless of how we want to criticize them in the past for the offense and the simplistic philosophies that we've had, uh, we are no longer simplistic at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> at all. And at all. it's working in our favor. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you coming through, man. These This has been – we say it 15 minutes, we've been going for 15, which is – Are you serious? Yes, it's been 15 minutes. I'm sorry, man. You got stuff no, to do. No, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Um, you messed you messed up and got me on a day when I'm I'm visiting. We're visiting family, and, and the kids are upstairs playing with uh, their grandparents. So, like, I got time on my hands. <laughs> you know, like they say, I got time. I'm I'm happy to do it. Uh, I wish I could do this more often. It's just mm-hmm. the technology uh, availability, number one. And number two, you know, a little side business that I run takes up 30, 35, 40 hours of my week. Uh, of time each week and um man this man, is life life be fun. life that's what life be life and sometimes well, you hopefully, do what you got to do hopefully we can do this again um after the super bowl no, and yeah, uh yeah, yeah. and, and any, um anytime you got like lead the rest of this the rest of the times we playing i can squeeze it in for the most part because you kind of yeah. got idea when i'm off and you know i'm real flexible once i get home by one o'clock so just it let goodness. me know when, when you fit and I, 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 we can make it work if if we have a chance to do it. So yeah, it's so a good problem, to have, coach. coach. We'll, we'll go back and forth, and and we'll 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 do that. So I appreciate you coming through. Always watching, you know, when especially when I'm at work. 
when when you pop them up and I'm at work, I pop them on and <laughs> stick my headphone in my ear. And that's like I Are saw you? the play. I saw when you were talking about um the San Francisco guys getting up on the linebackers, and you was like, if Queen and Roquan got to deal with this all day, we could be in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> that stood out in my mind when I watched that that, that video. Uh, the other day. But we we want our matchups up up front. You know, Travis Jones, Matabike, uh, yeah. Washington. Those guys. It's a it's a you know you know when you're coaching D line and or inside linebackers and you talk to the D line like, hey man, my guys can't do their job if if you're not getting hands on somebody. You right. if you, you got to get hands on somebody, or you better make the play. And at the well, we have a dude Matabike who makes the plays all game long. Uh, Washington Jones and Pierce is also very, very good. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed Andrew. with what we did. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just, man, we got a special group, and um, and it's fun. It's fun to cover this team. Exactly. Let the um the people that don't follow you know where they can find your stuff to follow you. Well, all 22 films on uh, YouTube, and this past year I started a Twitter X, whatever people want to call it, and uh, that's a lot of fun too. Uh, to put hey, small. Bye. Yeah, yeah, at times, but I don't know about you, man. I got to mute a lot of people. It's not, it's what? not a disrespectful thing, but I got to mute a lot of people because I can't be clicking on it and reading uh, thirty comments to it. I don't have that kind of time on my hands. Uh, so there's some people that it'll be like two months later. I'm, I'm really like, oh, I forgot I muted him. Let me, uh, let me unmute him <laughs> so I can check in and see how he's doing. <laughs> you know. So anyway, man, uh, that's I'm on Twitter and YouTube for now, and that's pretty much it. I can't think of any other platforms that will be worth my time. Uh, appreciate man you let me come on the show man it was fun i hope you guys are having a great holiday uh, and uh, we got another tough one this week man most definitely most definitely i'm gonna go watch uh, hard knocks nine and see what they're talking about <laughs> yeah man it, it's gonna be fun i haven't i grabbed some dolphins film throughout the year just like with the 49ers to you know slowly accumulate the film but i just haven't been able to label it all because like i said no time and uh i do think there's some similarities but the the risk factor for is changed a little bit you know the yeah. risk factor with tyree killing them dudes you know, changes and flips it a little bit more in their favor. We make one mistake coverage wise and them dudes can take it to the house. Exactly. Exactly. But again, that's, uh, we're going to wrap it right here. Cause if we start with the dolphins, we'll be another out. <laughs> Cause I, I like, love what the dolphins do on offense. Everybody think they're a passing team. They are not. Yeah. So just leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> leave it I at agree, that. man. Appreciate, appreciate you having me on. Like I said, man, you messed up and, and family <laughs> during the time when I had, when I had availability. So, uh, thanks all again. Good. That's all good. All good. All good.